graph just aha this meeting is now being recorded i'll start again uh, welcome to the spinard community council meeting on june 2nd 2021 starting at 7 p.m uh, welcome to everyone there's been about 22 people on for a little while doing our visiting uh, Tom McGrath just um, moved to approve the agenda. And if anybody wants to second that, and then I can. Second. Okay. This is Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Hi. Oh. All right. So um, the first thing on here is the orientation, call to order, et cetera. Then we're going to go to the state legislators. And we have Chris Tuck here. I don't know if I've seen anyone else yet. Um, then we'll have our. Uh, reports, assembly report, if Cameron Perez Verdia is here, Anchorage School Board, Margo Bellamy, airport report, I see John Johansson on, and Anchorage Police Department, I think Officer Reed might be um, getting replaced by um, another officer, Ooh, but I just blanked on his name. Then we're going to have um, a little discussion topic, Tani is going to lead that about the Spinard Beautification Project, uh, the Spinard uh, community council cleanup report and um, support a proposed Matson grant for 2500 and then the next piece of business we have 10 minutes on each of these discussions is the traffic calming resolution amendment um, then going into the education topic uh, which is the west anchorage snow disposal site that'll be josie wilson i've spoken with her already today the next thing will be education topic title 21 amendment for parking um, issues and that's elizabeth appleby then at the about 820 point neighborhood and community announcements it asks you to please raise your hand and then unmute and you can chat um, for everyone about 10 minutes hopefully that'll be finished up and then by 8 30 we're going to do our door prize which is a a gas card gift card giveaway you must be a spinard community council member and present to win and let's see uh, ariana is our treasurer she'll handle that and at 8 35 we plan to adjourn so hopefully that'll run through so if anybody has not been on an, a zoom type meeting before like i was saying earlier i'm familiar with zoom as a teacher i've substitute taught for the entire school year of 2021 on Zoom, um, but it's a little different maybe with the meeting. And um, I, I don't, if you misbehave, I can put you in the waiting room. That's what we did at school, but I know I can't do that here. So anyway, just um, a reminder to um, be recognized. I am Irene Pearson Gamble, the vice chair, and I'm filling in for Lindsay tonight, who's taking a extended trip somewhere out in the wonderful world of Alaska. So, um, I think basically, you know, um, one of the things we need to make sure that everyone is included in our um, list of attendance. So you need to include your first and your last name um, in your um, window. And that way um, we can be sure to include everyone who's attending. It looks like right now the number of people participants is 27. So pretty good. We usually get a little over 30 or more. So the agenda has been approved and seconded. I'll assume that's fine. Um, I don't think we wanna add very much things tonight because we do have a lot to cover, um, but I will start off with just introducing our executive board. As I said, I'm the vice filling in for Lindsay and uh, Meg Milkey is our secretary and she's my super co-host and Tani, where did you, there she is, uh, sure saw it and then um, is Arena on yet? I don't know if I see her. And Julie Leonard is one of our oh, I don't see. Um, one of our, yeah, whatever. What is that called? Auditors. <laughs> and then Peggy's our backup auditor, Peggy Hoff, and I see she's there. Great. All right. I don't see anyone else in our group so okay that'll be it and we will continue with our agenda so um first legislator reports and i see we are so right on time and i am going to be careful with the time and i know meg is going to help me too um 
as a teacher, I'm used to the bell rings and you know that the kids have to get ready to go. So we won't be ringing bells, but we did hear that when anyone enters the meeting tonight, there is a little um, chime sound. So we'll be kind of hearing if more people join us. So our first legislator that is online is uh, Representative Chris Tuck. And you've got a full 10 minutes if Matt Clayman, oh no, I saw Matt Clayman too. Okay, you got a full five minutes and then Matt Clayman has his five minutes. So you can start. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thanks for having me this evening. I hope everyone had a great Memorial uh, weekend as well as I hope that uh, everybody is staying safe and doing well. Um, I just came back from Juneau last night. I'm glad to, uh, to uh, arrive to some sunshine today. It was really nice to have because uh, Juneau has been really wet. And as I was saying earlier, it was the uh, wettest, second wettest month of May, month of May that uh, Juneau has ever um, uh, recorded. Uh, real quick, the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, I mean, sorry, Permanent Fund is uh, now about $80.1 billion. Just 10 years ago, it was half that at $40.1 billion. Um, the fund was valued at the start of FY 2021 at 65.3 billion. So it's growing fast, extremely fast. We're actually at a 25% rate of return right now so far in FY 21. And the average is usually about 7% a year. So um, we're doing very well with our permanent fund earnings uh, currently. Uh, you heard in the news recently that um, the Biden administration has suspended all oil and gas um, leasing activities there in Arctic National Wildlife Reserve. Uh, it's uh, going to be pending, the suspension is pending completion of a comprehensive uh, NEPA analysis and the Interior Department will conduct that, that environmental analysis and review legal deficiencies on the current leasing program. Uh, the Anwar lease sale was held last January on January 6th. Um, the primary respondent really was uh, Ada, Alaska Industrial Development Export Authority. Uh, they uh, took on seven of the nine tracks. Um, unfortunately, you only raised about $12 million at that time, but uh, Ada does have 365,000 acres of the 430 acres that were, that were up for, for leasing. So we'll see what happens with uh, um, Anwar um, down the road. Um, our, right now we're in special session. Our special session is uh, basically to uh, finish with our, um, the state's budgets, as well as um, um, solving the uh, dividend situation that uh, Alaska has been facing. Uh, finally, the governor does want to see us do a, um, a constitutional amendment to uh, put to the vote of the people at a 50-50 split and to constitutionalize the 5% um, percent of market value of draw for for uh, um, for that 50 50 split half going to dividends and half uh, paying for uh, state government. <clears throat> so currently we are still in uh, conference committee. The House passed the budget um, over to the Senate. The Senate uh, finally passed their version of the operating budget on the very last evening of the of regular session and. Um, the governor saw that we were going to be a little bit delayed and we we're going to take some time. So he was courteous enough to uh, let us know a week ahead of time that he plans on holding a special session. Uh, that way people can prepare for it. Uh, we expected in the House to have the uh, operating budget done by now. Uh, the Senate basically combined all of the, uh, op all the budgets together into a comprehensive uh, omnibus bill. And so the differences are now being worked out during the conference committee between the House version and the Senate version. Just to give you a quick rundown, um, our Senate members are Stedman, Bishop, and Olson. Our House members are Foster, Merrick, LeBon, with Foster being the uh, um, chair and with uh, Senator Stedman being the vice chair. And so the Senate version has about $1.5 billion deficit that would be filled by overdrawing from their energy reserve account. Um, they also are spending about 7% of the value of the permanent fund, and they have about a $4 billion transfer from the permanent fund's earnings reserve account into the corpus of the permanent fund. We did something similar to that in 2019. At that time, it was a $9 billion transfer. The governor had vetoed $5 billion of that, and so the Senate would like to see that um, another $4 billion transfer again this year. We also have a permanent fund dividend of around $2,300 per eligible Alaskan. 
Um, that's under discussion right now between the House and the Senate. The House version didn't have a permanent fund dividend in that. We were looking forward to having another bill come in behind us to determine what we're going to do with the permanent fund dividend as well as how we're going to restructure that. So unfortunately, that didn't happen, but that's one of the reasons why we're in special session right now is to determine um, once and for all what the permanent fund dividend formula should be and how it should uh, move forward. The Senate version also has 13.2 million in funding for a proposed Alaska Long Trail. That's that 500 mile trail that will extend from Fairbanks down to Seward. Um, several portions of the bill already does exist. I mean, sorry, of the trail already does exist. And I just want to take it a little bit further. Um, they do have $2 million for energy weatherization program. 1.5 billion from the earnings reserve to pay for the 2022 PFD, a million dollars of new fuel tank and other improvements for the University of Alaska Southeast. Um, they have intent language of paying a $1,200 bonus to return um, people to the workforce. Uh, people are out of work, so a bonus if they return back to work. The bonus will be paid after four weeks of, of, of work. And if a person returns uh, part time, then they would get half of that um, after four weeks worth of work. So be $600 a one-time payment. The house version, um, we have um, a POMV draw of about $3.1 billion. Um, partially funded with $700 million in federal funding from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we have $4.2 billion unrestructured general funds to the to the uh, Senate's, I can't remember what theirs was. They're, they're a little, little bit higher and it's not too much higher. I think they're like 4.6. We have $5 million going in for pre-K. We fully fund the school bond debt reimbursement. Actually, the Senate version does as well, so that should be easy to take off the table. $144 million to pay for old tax credits, $2.7 million for public radio and television grants, uh, $635,000 for the Alaska State uh, Online Library System, $210,000 for corporate income tax auditors, $70.5 million for community assistance, $1.3 million increase for public defenders in Alaska, 3 million increase for, for prospectors, I'm sorry, prosecutors, and uh, 650,000 for fish hatcheries in Petersburg and Juneau, and another 250,000 for the civil air control. Hey, so, we're looking at uh, reaching your time limit, Representative Tuck. I want to make sure Mr. Clayman can get on too. Sure, it sounds good. And I just talk about real quick uh, uh, what the governor's version is on the Alaska Permanent Fund and the PFD. He wants to again put the 5% POMV into the Alaska Constitution. A 50-50 split for the for the draw to go for uh, state government and for the permanent fund dividend, and it puts the power cost equalization program into the corpus of the fund and has an endowment for that. And that keeps us from uh, the three quarter draw, and um, and then transfers the ERA into the corpus of the Alaska permanent fund dividend of about seventeen billion dollars. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have after after okay. Representative Clayman's done. Great. All right, thank you. Let's switch to uh, Representative Clayman. You've got four and a half or maybe three and a half minutes, but we'll give you a little extra if you need it. Anything else to add? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a little bit, a bigger picture of the, the really the, the major issues on the budget. I, I come back and listen to folks. I'm actually here in Spinard tonight. The Spinard Jazz Festival is in full swing and, oh. and I, I will leave here and go, go to hear some live music and it's great to be home. We are in a special session and we really have a the big challenge in front of Alaska financially continues to be the dividend. That's the elephant in the room. And part of that is whether or not we're going to overdraw the permanent fund earnings reserve to pay the massive dividend that the Senate has proposed, which is $2,300 or an even bigger dividend like the governor's asking for. Neither budget is bigger than the $2,300 dividend. But the big question is whether, whether we're going to stay within the the statutory limits for what we can draw from the earnings reserve, which is 5%. If we want to break the law, which is what the governor wants to do, then we could go higher. The Senate also is proposing to break the law. The House, the majority of the House has not supported that, although we did not have a dividend in the budget. I think there's a lot of push to have probably a thousand dollar dividend that would actually not overdraw the earnings reserve. That's the big question. There's already been a lawsuit threatened that if we overdraw the earnings reserve, there'll be a lawsuit saying that we actually have to comply with the law, even though some have suggested that there's no requirement to follow the law. I'm somebody who believes we really have to follow the law. It's sound financial policy, it's sound investment policy, and it's really how we protect the permanent fund for the future. So those are the, those are the really the two big 
big issues. And I, I know when when I start going through the list of different details on the budget, a lot of the, the constituents and friends I see, they kind of look at me like, boy, it's tough to be down there in Juneau because there's so many details to the budget. But what I can report is that the really big issue is the dividend. It's very divisive in the state. It's very divisive in the legislature. And we're working to find, find a, a, a means to go forward. The second part is the governor has a number of constitutional amendments that he's pushing forward with. And I think a real question we need to hear from the public is how engaged is the public? How aware is the public of these issues on these various constitutional amendments? And if the public really isn't, isn't following these in great detail, it probably is a sign that the legislature shouldn't go forward with these kinds of major changes that the governor is proposing. So those are some of the issues that we have. And I'm not sure if I've used my, my full time, but happy to answer questions. But again, uh, challenging times and, and the dividend is the elephant in the room. Thank you. Yes, you just have you went over one minute. I see that Paul Berger's hand is raised. You can unmute and ask your question, please. Oh, no, just, I, I'm not, just to educate me, uh, I heard a lot of mon millions flying around from Representative Talk, which I appreciate, and then a lot of billions when it came to the actual returns. And when Matt was speaking, we we're talking about breaking the law and how much we're going to give back. Was the law changed or broken some point not too long ago where we had a formula that worked that we were following, but we changed that formula and we're trying to work that out? I mean, why didn't we just stay with the original intent of the PFD and not monkey with it? So there's there's two parts of the answer. First is that there's the statutory formula about how big the dividend is according to statute. That that question has been presented to the Alaska Supreme Court. The Alaska court um, in, in no uncertain terms said that the this dividend has to compete for scarce dollars with every other state program. And there's a number of programs like uh, bond debt reimbursement, power, power cost equalization, uh, community assistance that we have not followed the formulas for years. I understand. So there's no requirement that we follow the permanent fund statute. In contrast, the percent of market value limit on spending is a cap on spending the Supreme Court has never addressed that particular question about whether the cap is enforceable. We passed the cap in 2018. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, 2018 we passed the cap and we have never exceeded the cap since that point in time. This is the first time that there's a proposal from the governor to overdraw that cap. And part of his proposal is actually to transfer $3 billion from the cap and transfer it from the earnings reserve and put it into constitutional budget reserve. So, so he's got a number of proposals that, that break the law that I think we should be following. I mean, the permanent fund is followed very closely by almost every Alaska as opposed to the other programs you mentioned. Right. And that, that's kind of one of the, from the optics point of view, it just seems the one to get it out of the way and get back to some kind of predictable formula that we can all look at. Because right now we see you're getting this, you're getting that, you're getting this. For those of us who have been here forever, remember it was just a formula. We got a number and that was the end of it. Um, I mean, it would smooth things out a lot for the population just to get back to some kind of predictable, we don't know what it's going to be, but we know it's tied to something real, not not to, you know, budgets or politics, um, for what it's worth. And, and right. basically what Representative Clayman is saying is everything's subject to appropriations, whether no, it's I the or the permanent fund dividend. And I think that's the reason why the governor is trying to pass some sort of constitutional amendment, because then that's the only way that you can um, basically not break the law. Oh, I appreciate that. that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I do see there's a comment in chat. Meg, have you had a chance to look at that chat? We, okay, nothing I need to jump on. We're just trying to make sure that the chat doesn't turn into too much side um, conversations, but um, yeah. yeah. I'll say really quickly, if folks have questions, feel free to message me directly as Irene will be kind of coordinating um, the meeting and introducing guests. So if you guys have stuff, send it my way and we can uh, get to you. So I think with that, we might want to move on to our next uh, section um, and then we'll go back for questions if there's extra time. That sounds good. Okay. Um, thanks, Meg. I do see Peggy and Bob, your hand is up. Do you have something quick? Unmute. I do. Um, I'm, I don't want this to take this too long, but I'm sure that you're aware that some really big decisions around the globe have been happening regarding oil companies. So Royal Dutch Share um, uh, Royal Dutch Oil got a major setback in their high court. Uh, there was a big decision about shareholders um, in Houston uh, with Exxon and BP, I think was the third. They were all, um, all of them were talking about they're going to have to 
uh, move away from oil and gas. And because that's our main form of getting, uh, you know, that's what funds are, dividends and everything. Has the legislature even talked about this? I mean, these are three of the largest oil companies in the, in the world. And, um, you know, obviously it's gonna have trickle down effects. So do they talk about this at the legislature? Is that Matt, do you wanna answer? Sure, I can, I can do it. There's two parts to the answer. First is there is some discussion about alternative energy. It's not getting a lot of attention in the legislature, but from a standpoint of the oil economy in Alaska, we've actually changed from being an oil state to an investment state because in the early eighties, we were 85% funded by oil taxes funding state government. Now 70% of state government funding is coming from investment earnings from the permanent fund and the earnings from the oil is down under a billion dollars. So. So we've actually flipped from being an oil state now to being an investment state. And so that's a reality that's also tied into the oil economy on an international basis that, that at least the, the short, the, we're, right now there's not any prospects that we're gonna return to the levels of high oil income in oil tax income that would allow us to use, to stop using the permanent fund earnings to fund government. All right, thank you. Let's at least, Good to hear that there is some discussion about alternative fuel sources, because we know that's super important to include that for sustainability. Peggy, does that help? Okay. Yes, wow. thank you. Yeah, you can take your hand down. Um, I'm just noticing a few people um, with just an iPhone written in um, and someone else just a phone number with, um, um, oops, just made that small for myself. With, with no name attached. So if you can put your name somewhere, make sure we can get there. Um, okay, I see a number, yeah, 719-9128. There's no name on that. All right, so a little bit behind on that one, but very close. Thank you so much, both of you, uh, representatives, Tuck and Clayman. Thank you very so, much, have a great day. Okay, yep, and enjoy the jazz festival. I wanna go over two later. <laughs> Sounds fun. We'll okay, um, so now we'll go to the uh, reports, our um, standard reports. And I don't know, assembly person, Cameron Perez Dia, is he on or some representative for him on? Judy? Hi, it's me, Judy. I'm yes. here. I'm uh, really excited to be here. I, I'm still not Cameron. Uh, so sorry about that. But I'm really excited to be here today because normally when Cameron needs me to pinch hit, my hair looks crazy and I have to stay off camera, but he caught me on a great hair day. And so I feel really relieved to be presenting my best self for you. Thank you. Thanks, Irene, for understanding. Okay. Um, the update that we have is really um, short for the night. Of course, we're still um, encouraging people, if you haven't yet gotten vaccinated, to get vaccines. We're, the Muni has stood up vaccine clinics for youth in the 12 to 15 approved age bracket if they choose. There's still no requirement about getting a vaccine, but it is certainly helpful. We're well on the way to getting toward a 70% vaccination rate here in Anchorage. Um, a couple of weeks ago when I looked last, we were just over 60% of people having had their first vaccine, and that's really great um, for people who are choosing that. The, this past assembly meeting was first quarter budget revision. Um, we'll be sending out a detailed breakdown of the first quarter budget revisions that were made, but it did happen and I wanted to let you know. And then the other big exciting thing that's coming up is um, another town hall on the B3 zoning will be held at the Denina Center on Thursday, so tomorrow from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And that'll be available online also at all of the normal channels. So usually you can find those streaming from the uh, municipal clerk's office Facebook page, as well as the uh, Muni's YouTube channel. And I will pass those links through to Meg to be shared out into the chat if possible. Yes. Great. But otherwise I'm just here to ask questions. And then I wanted to let you all know that this is actually my last month serving West Anchorage. So the next time that you meet again, you'll have Cameron, Austin should be back and then likely a new staffer as well. Um, so I really appreciate working with all of you over the past several years. And I accepted a new job um, working to help um, caregivers. So I'm really excited about it. It's a job that was really um, crafted for me and so sad to be leaving, but couldn't be more excited about where I'm going. Great, thank you for sharing that little bit of personal information. So 
we will see you around. You can still come to our meetings, you know, even if you don't Thank want you to. Thank you very much. I am a Spinard alumni, so. Okay, that's good. Yep, as long as your hair looks great, you're so welcome. No, great, please. or I will stay off camera because it's a respect thing. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody have a question for Judy, Justin? We do have one question. Uh, the first one that came through on my end was from Rosemary. Rosemary, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Uh, I just received the notice of a public hearing regarding a new package store on the corner of Minnesota and Northern Lights. And I'm quite concerned about that. Uh, and it's rather close to Central and not, um, excuse me, said the junior high and senior high school. Uh, what can we do about that? I think Bernard area has more than their fair share of packaged liquor stores. And there are at least four liquor stores within a two block radius of this new liquor store. Uh, what can we do about that? Well, I hate to, I always hate to punt away from our office as being the central point of responsibility, but the municipality takes the feedback from the community councils on this issue really seriously. And the Spinard Community Council has an internal process by which they evaluate whether or not the people trying to come in are good candidates. Um, and I think this council has a, a alcohol and marijuana sub subcommittee or full committee that means regularly and that's who I would talk to first the councils are going to be able to weigh in on whether or not they think that's a good idea and usually you'll have at least one point of public uh, uh, pu opportunity to make a public comment on that as well before the body before that is you know approved or denied as a community council this is going to be heard by the assembly on June 22nd so uh we have not, ha as a community council, talked about this. And am I, and I address this to the, my fellow uh, people here in Spinard, am I the only one that's concerned about this uh, new liquor store coming in? I think Tanya hey. would like to check in on that. I see her hand yeah, can up. I jump in and provide some clarification? Yeah. So um, first of all, I. I am also concerned um, about this as well. And uh, I will say though, technically it's not in our Spinard Community Council boundaries. And if you look at the boundary map, the boundary for Spinard because of how they cut the boundaries out is Minnesota. So technically, again, I think it's kind of ridiculous. It is in Turnigan Community Council. Um, they have had multiple meetings with the group. It's, Vita, it's the Vitus gas station. They've had multiple meetings with the, the group about what their plans are. I did attend a meeting, one of their committee meetings last week as um, sort of a community member, but also a, a rep for Spinard. And I will say it didn't, I had to leave early, but it did not appear that they were going to object to the um, gas station. It, I'm not sure if anybody has any other updates on that, but um, they, there are many, we as a community council can provide input or as an individual, you can provide input. It's just that in this case, um, where the, the people who they've been going through primarily is turn again. They did do a presentation with us. I wanna say it was about a year and a half ago where they came and they, or a year ago, and they said they wanted community input. Um, and then they never came back to us because I think they figured out that they didn't have to come back to our community council meetings. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I also am concerned, but um, I just wanted to throw that out there so that there was some more context. That's helpful. Um, and then, thank you. <laughs> the notice that I received says the community councils, Turnigan and Spinard, they mentioned both community councils and uh, for whatever reason. Um, okay, then I guess uh, I am a member of the Turnigan Community Council and I will funnel my, they meet tomorrow night and I guess we'll have a discussion, but goodness, we just have enough liquor stores in our area. I feel like we're picked upon. Rosemary, can you send the, the Spinard email um, a copy of that 
notice because I, you know, our executive committee meets monthly and I don't think that it was, it wasn't on our radar that this was something that we were being included in notices. So I, if there's a way to do that, it's Bernard S, it's Bernard CC at gmail.com. I think that's something for um, maybe our executive committee to just talk about as well. Okay, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Rosemary. And thank you, Tony, for that clarification. And I don't recall that. And I do go to all the executive meetings and I don't recall that specific location. All right, thank you. We'll go on to our next um, report is the school board and Margot Bellamy, you're on. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I have a very brief report, but I mostly wanted to just come and introduce myself and to let you know that I've been appointed to uh, the Spenard Community Council. So I'll be your representative. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, uh, before we meet each month, um, I welcome those. Um, so, um, and with that, I, you know, I just have just a few things. Uh, we, we had our meeting, we met uh, yesterday and uh, had our last uh, uh, public testimony on how to use our ESSER three funds. Uh, those are the um, funds that are coming to us from the federal government. And we have, we, we have uh, given our community several opportunities to provide us input. The survey remains open on our website. Um, and I, I, I usually will do a little report and in the report, you'll have the link so that you can get to the places that I'm talking about tonight. Um, and our next meeting won't be until, we don't meet in July, but we will meet again, uh, of course, in August. Uh, but until prior to that, we have our school board retreat that's coming up. Uh, and that will be a two day, uh, a day and a half event over a Friday and a Saturday. And then we have our joint meeting with the assembly and we're looking forward to that. The two items, um, the big items done for that discussion will be the uses, the usage of our ARPA funds and then ASD FEMA reimbursement and how that impacts the school bond uh, indebtedness. So those will be the two major and that will be Monday the 7th from five to seven. So if you're interested in that. If you'd like to testify for either the joint assembly meeting or our school board meetings, uh, we have a new process. If you'll click on the school board link, uh, you'll be able, that form will come up and you can either, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, complete the form to testify in person, in writing, uh, or you can do it telephonically. So all those options are available to you. We launched a new equity dashboard last night. Uh, and that's very, it's on the first page of our website. Basically it highlights our academic programs, uh, discipline and other program opportunities. And it shows how our kids have access to those. And um, of course, how, we, how we're doing, how, how, how all of our kids are doing. And not just academically, but uh, it, relative to discipline, graduation, and everything. You already know school's out, and you already probably know if you have kids that we're in the middle of summer school, not the middle, the beginning. So we have approximately 10,000 students participating in, in our summer learning program. And uh, that started uh, actually, yes, on Tuesday, yesterday. And it, there's still some COVID information on our website, free testing, uh, for families and students who need it. Uh, and of course, the vac we're not doing the, vac the, uh, vac the clinic at the Ed Center anymore, but we have contracted uh, uh, or in partnership with the Muni to make sure that our families and students are able to get the, uh, get the, uh, vac the vaccinations. They do require parental uh, permission and the parent has to be present. And our fall lottery dates are open. So if you have grandkids or you have your own kids that you want to be to consider being in a lottery program, uh, that information is also on our website. And so with that, I'll answer questions, but I'm just happy to meet you and I look forward to working uh, with Spenard uh, this next year. Thank you. Great, thank you, Margo. Does anyone have any questions for her? Okay, great. 
Well, as a substitute teacher, I have met you several times and I really I, appreciate I you. recognize you. <laughs> yeah, you're very, very responsive. I see, I see, I see several friendly faces in the, in the yeah, well, you're all friendly, but friendly meaning uh, familiar faces. <laughs> no, I do appreciate you're always very quick to respond for anyone who hasn't worked with um, Margo before. I found her to answer just very promptly and I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Irene. You're welcome. And then our next report is for the airport. And some people go, why do we always have this report? But um, there are some people here that know why, because we used to be neglected or ignored. And it's really important because we live right by the airport. It's really one of our big neighbors. So John Johansson, I saw you on it, could share your report. Thanks. Thank you, Irene. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to have a very brief report. Uh, it's uh, our Anchorage Airport uh, update for June is posted on our website. And uh, just just got some few items here I'm gonna talk about. We're, we're still dealing with the coronavirus like everybody else, but the good thing is, is that uh, DHSS has set up a free vaccination clinic. It's on upper level, the ticketing level uh, near the entrance to a concourse. And uh, there are free vaccinations for anyone that's interested, whether you're a traveler, a resident or non-resident, you can go there and get your coronavirus vaccine. Uh, we are seeing a, a, a pretty big increase in uh, passenger traffic at the airport. Consequently, we're seeing a pretty big increase at the curbside uh, for people coming to pick up their friends and family on the bag claim level. And we ask that you use a cell phone parking lot that is now fairly well signed. It's your first right after you, as you're heading in on uh, West International and you cross the intersection with Jewel Lake and Spinard, it is your first right and uh, follow the signs from there. And we're also recruiting for a whole bunch of people um, if you're interested in uh, any of those uh, jobs, um, you can see them on our uh, on this update, and uh, there's a links to where you can find more information about the positions. But a lot of uh, maintenance personnel, heavy equipment mechanics, uh, county tech, some uh, leasing staff, etc. And that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions or take comments. Okay, does anybody have a question for John? It looks like Shani, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I did. Sorry, I don't have my headphones on otherwise. That's what the echo is. Um, yeah, John, I was wondering if I've been following the West Anchorage snow dump, um, the change in location to the parcel at the Connors Bog uh, Dog Park, the parcel that's owned by the municipality. Um, which it was interesting to learn that half of the park is owned by the municipality and half is owned by the state of Alaska. So my question for you is in their proposal, they are looking to make improvements to the dog park. I was wondering if, because they would be moving it to help with environmental impact. Um, it, does the improvements also include um, the half that the state of Alaska owns or the airport owns, I guess? If you know that, and if not, would you object to any improvements um, to the to, to the half that the Muni leases from you? John, you hear that? Maybe he's frozen. Uh, you are muted, John. Can you unmute and respond? Unless you're frozen in that big snow pile that still hasn't melted. Okay, I don't see a response from John at this point. Uh, John, can you put anything in the chat and let us know? All right, Tony, you might not get your answer on that one. Um, one Our quick thing, uh, sorry for interrupting. Irene, huh? is, uh, no. uh, Arena's not here. I was kind of scrambling a little bit on my end to put some uh, the sign-in sheet together. So I'm putting that in the chat belatedly. Thank you, Tanya, for being my guinea pig to oh, good. see if it works. So I'm putting that in the chat now. Please um, fill that out. That's how we keep track of attendance and we will be drawing uh, for a gift card at the end. Um, so great. Quick thing. Okay. Yeah. 
Thanks for that reminder, Meg. Um, I see that some people are together like Margaret and Matt and Peggy and Bob. Um, and I think Paul and Becky and my husband is sitting over there and he's listening to everything, but he, his hair day today just wasn't up to par. No, <laughs> kidding. Um, so I did also have a couple questions for John, but I think um, they're probably self-answered. Some, I have Airbnb people, they've asked, does Lyft and Uber and taxi service run 24 seven at the airport? And I thought, well, that everybody knows that, but I just was gonna check him for sure. And the other thing I suggested to him a couple months ago is that they should have a little coffee cart truck out in the cell phone lot that people that are sitting there waiting for their people to come in, they could go get a tea or a coffee or a, I don't know, nowadays maybe a shave ice. So John, if you can hear us, those are our suggestions. Okay, let's move on then to our police department report. And um, I do still have Officer Reed's name written here. I didn't get a chance to change anything. Is there someone on that is representing the police department? Thought I heard a... Hi there, uh, I'm Officer Natasha Welch. Oh, good, that's your number down there that I was wondering. Okay, Natasha, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so I got a couple of questions actually from Judy Jessen on behalf of Cameron Perez Verdia um, regarding the best way to contact the CAP team to check on their progress in responding to reports of camps and illegal dumping made through the Anchorage Work, Works um, app site. Um, and then Judy, I think, writes, in the past, our office has reached out to Chris Schutte for updates, but she's wondering if there's more of an appropriate place for the public to go to check on um, illegal camps. And so I sent um, an email to our community council at gmail.com this evening about 630. And I'm wondering if you guys received that email that highlighted um, where the public can ask questions regarding that specific homeless camp and kind of where it is in the queue of being cleaned up. Did, did uh, somebody who checks the Gmail, Spinard Community Council email, get that from me? Uh, yep, and I can go ahead and put that info in the chat for folks to be able to access that. Yeah, so it's homeless, homeless camp info at anchorageak.gov um, and she'll put it in the, the chat. Um, if you guys can put it up somewhere else as well for the public to access, that's a great way. Once you've gone onto the link and have posted a, a homeless camp, um, you can then follow up by emailing us and uh, we'll be able to give you more kind of um, better feedback. Okay. And then somebody asked about the average response time for APD over the last four years. Uh, and I will say, I talked to dispatch supervisor this evening on my way here. And uh, we don't have an average response time to anything because the way that we respond to everything depends on the severity of the crime. So for instance, like, uh, sex assaults, robberies, homicide, kidnapping, um, missing kids and vulnerable adults. Those all take priority over calls where there's a disturbance and people are pushing and shoving each other, but they're able to separate within their home and stay away from each other until police arrive on scene and assess what's going on. There's, so set, response times are always varying because multiple things can happen all over the city which drew which draw officers to specific parts of that city for instance last wednesday afternoon like at two o'clock in the afternoon we had um a drive-by shooting up in the midtown we had a possible kidnapping which turned out not to be a kidnapping on the east side of town so those two incidents in the afternoon of a wednesday just kind of drew apd officers to two separate parts of the town because they were labor intensive. We had to try to find what was going on and figure out where things were going, who needed medics and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's very complicated to give exact response times because there's too much of a variable in there. We respond, obviously the response time to uh, a sex assault in progress is gonna be very different from a response to uh, a 
neighbor with a loud television set inside their own home where everybody's okay and everybody's breathing. So it's a tough question to answer. And I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer, but we just, there's no good way to tell you our average response time is this, this, and this, because there's too many variables that come into play with APD responding. Okay, that's understandable. Yeah, and I mean, I hate to give you that, that's such a weird answer, but it's absolutely, I will say every month on every month on the full moon, of course, that's a busier day for all APD officers. And then the first snow day and then PFD day are two of the other biggest uh, calls for service day. And our average calls every day are around 800. Well, you get a prize for the most calls. That's amazing. Yeah, that's an average day um, in Anchorage, just calling dispatch, either the 911 or the 311 system. 800 is a pretty good average from, you know, midnight 01 till uh, 1159 or midnight the next day. So, yeah, it's a, it's a busy town. We stay busy, that's for sure. And there's um, 26 to 28 police officers on the street at any one time. So I will end with that and happy to answer any questions that I possibly can. Keep in mind, I'm a police officer, so I don't have upper management level chief type of answers for bigger questions. I just have patrol officer answers for uh especially things like um, the CAP team that I'm on, we respond to illegal camps all over town. And so I'm busy out in the woods with uh, illegal camps, posting them all the time, all summer. All right, thank you, Officer Welch. Is anyone thinking about something that you would like to ask her or think about? I, and I actually do, and it's perfect that you are a patrol officer um in, in the past i've brought up the issues of the chelsea inn hotel and also the executive um is it executive suites over next to mcdonald's as two um long-term problem areas in regards to crime and drug activity um i was wondering you know i've, I've talked to somebody who works for an for the state troopers investigation team and i keep asking what are they doing and they keep deferring to they say, what is APD doing? Um, so my question for you as a patrol officer is twofold. What um, we, I know you can't do investigations, but what can we as community members do that actually can have an impact on our community when it comes to really problematic hotspots like those? Um, do you have any tips for us? I'll just leave it as, a, as, as that question. Sure, so uh, I, my favorite thing to do is to contact the owner and we can find who owns everything, right? Because by ordinance, we all have to um, show up on the property inquiry, parcel inquiry. Like when you go to the Muni uh, webpage under property, you can do a search for any address. So if you have the address of the Chelsea or the address of the executive suites, which is now called something else. I think it's called the America's Best Suites in, in Anchorage or something very long. Um, but I still call it the Executive Suites because I was raised here and that's what it always was to me. But the you can always find out who owns that. And I do know that the Executive Suites owner lives at the hotel upstairs right above the office. Um, and so we have talked to him in the past, but uh, putting, the policy that they have at their hotel for who they accept as guests and the rules that guests have to abide by, all of those things come into play with the management of a hotel, right? So they're the best people to kind of talk to and to express concerns to and to see what their policy is and whether they're adhering to it. Sometimes national chains, like I'm not sure if the executive suite has a chain like element to it so there's like franchise policy sometimes attached to that stuff sometimes um i know america's best suite or executive suites i think is a franchise but then chelsea is a locally owned hotel um and i'm not 
sure. I haven't talked to the owner of that hotel, um, and anybody can chime in if you know who the owner of the Chelsea Inn is. But uh, but I have talked to the executive suites owner because he lives right above the office. Okay. Does that help, Tony? Yeah, thanks. And actually, I would say that's probably the first time we've gotten, well, I'll just speak for myself, that I've gotten an answer that I felt was actually helpful and not just a pat on the head. And so thank you. Great. Thank you, Natasha. You're a star. Yeah, absolutely. I always, um, I'm a big old fashioned letter writer and I always like, I like the power of, of pressure a little bit to put pressure on people and say, hey, this is our community. This is not acceptable behavior. Your, um, you know, your policies, the way you're running your hotel maybe is not up to the right standard or, you know what I mean? Like just lining out what the problems that a community is seeing, that's sometimes way more impactful than just uh, than other courses of action I've seen. Interesting. I'm just going to pop in here something that the Spinard Community Council has memorandums of agreement with um, the uh, package stores, alcohol sales, um, uh, cannabis businesses, and asking them to, no, I don't want to say perform, but to have a business that we think fits in and no matter what it is, whether you agree with alcohol or any other substance, that they still run a decent business in our community. Now it just hits me that maybe, uh, Officer Welsh, you have an idea that we should possibly contact particularly Chelsea and the other hotel chain and ask for that kind of agreement that this is how we want our businesses in our community area to behave. For the safety and well-being of everyone, both the people that have the business and the people that um, frequent it, and the people that are next to it. Yeah, just a thought. All right, thank you. Any other comments? Tom, do you have a question? Uh, I just a comment. The guy that owns Chelsea Inn, it's either him or his brother. They also own the Mush Inn. They own the hotel at Fifteenth and uh, Gamble. Gamble. Uh, they own the Royal Suites. Uh, these guys, to my way of thinking, should have been put out of their misery many years ago. They are the slum lords of Anchorage. And to go talk to them would be dangerous as far as I'm concerned. Uh, my feeling is the police and the municipality are not doing their job at all as far as this owner is concerned. And I would just leave it there. And I think Peggy could back me up on that. You know, like the uh, Paradise Inn, we tried for 30 years to get that thing closed down. And finally the DEA closed it down because of a drug deal. But they did white slavery, they did everything there. And for some reason, the municipality of Anchorage and APD wouldn't do a thing. Dang. Thank you. Sorry for that, sorry for the rant. <laughs> well, that's some background information to know that it's more than one own that it's one owner for more than one business. Um, yeah, all of those are not only Chelsea Inn is in the Spinard area, but I mean, all of us do move around Anchorage and are well aware of those other locations. I know there was a, gosh, I can't even think of the name of it, but it was downtown right in view of the Captain Cook Hotels and on between 4th and 5th Avenue, and it was an incredibly unsavory place and that somehow got closed down and completely wiped away from the surface of the earth and it turned into a parking lot so uh, like right offhand I can't think I want to say Black Angus again but I don't think that was the name no of it. it's called it was called the Inlet Inn and we worked with the property owner who was uh -huh. a development company and we worked with him uh, and it was a community effort the Catholic Church had priests who were getting beat up um, right across the street the transit center was feeding into that hotel. The Covenant House kids were just on the other side of it. And so we went around um, and we talked to all of those entities that were around the Inlet Inn Hotel. And uh, we had them write letters to the owner saying what a negative impact this one business was. And if the owner could you know, demolish it, uh, that would be great. There was an ADN newspaper article um, written, uh, it was a Sunday paper, Julia O'Malley story for a couple of Sundays. 
uh, years ago about that. And so there was social pressure put onto the owner to make a long-term change and the owner did. Okay. Great, thank you for that reminder. I, yeah, and, and that was it. Okay, interesting. Well, there we go. So maybe um, Tom, what we need to work on is more community pressure and not just expect the um, Anchorage Police Department to handle it. It does sound like it needs to come from lots of different directions. So very informative report. Thank you so much. All right, anything else? All right, so I guess you get to go back out on duty and look for whatever you need to look for, Officer Welch, good luck. Yes, ma'am, I'm gonna get back to a drug bus. Thank you so much, you guys, I appreciate the time. Well, thank you very much. Good night. All right, bye-bye. Okay, Oof, that was a topic. Um, all right, the next thing we have is um, Tani, and I'm gonna just jump ahead a little bit and suggest that the topic about the traffic calming resolution amendment that I'm listed as, I'd like to wait on that one and maybe go right after Tani's done to um, the West Anchorage Snow Disposable Site report with uh, Josie Wilson from HDR and then um, Elizabeth Appleby about Title 21 because I want to make sure those get included and um, we can maybe finish up with the amendment at the end. So if that would be okay to just shift, uh, shift the times a little bit, I'd appreciate that. Okay, so Tiny, do you want to quickly share with us? Um, ooh, look at those cool pictures. Yeah, your beautification. Thanks, Tiny. You've got I'm looking at the times. Oh, okay. Yes, we're a I, I will try to go um, as fast as possible, Irene. But I just wanted to share um, so some good uh, news. And these, so these are pictures from our Spinard cleanup. We actually did two. The first one was a little bit smaller. We had, I think, eight people total who came. Mm -hmm. um, car, and I will, I just want to actually stop and say that car Safeway, if you were on last month's meeting, you may have heard the district manager who um, offered to help support the event by providing snacks and water. And I wanted to just give them a shout out because I went to the store, they really came through. I think initially I had like one box and one, you know, one box of snacks and a package of bottled water. And the store manager saw that I only had one and really just was like, no, let's, let's give you more which actually prompted us to think about having a second event, which I'll show some pictures because we had so many snacks as a, as a leftover. But I will say the snacks, the water were a huge hit. So that's um, a really great example of a business being involved on the community level. So that's the one on Northern Lights, go support cars. So uh, this is from our first event. We cleaned up by um, back behind Napa and then along Spinard Road, we did you can see we picked up a tree. We also got a mattress. We had a lot of fun. That was a lot of trash. And then we had our second event. And I just want to say thank you to all of the volunteers. We did advert, we did post about this and share an event. And at first I thought we were going to have like 10 people again, maybe. But based on our counts, we had between 30 and 35 volunteers um, come to the event. And honestly, if we had known how many people were coming to the event, we might have picked an area that was a lot more trashy uh, with trash, but you know, because Spinard keeps it classy. But um, we we started at the Church of Love and we made our way. Um, it was actually really cool. We had a little like trash army and we went down 36 both directions, down Spinard both directions. A couple of us even hit Minnesota and back behind that park um, and the by the park on Minnesota and the those gas stations. And so we got a lot of trash. It was a beautiful day. Um, and again, all of the volunteers loved all of the snacks and water. Um, and so it was, it was just really a wonderful experience. Uh, again, we got a nice second bag of, or second load of trash. And we're really excited to just have people who came and, and, and did some hands-on work to make our community a more beautiful, cleaner, safer, because we had a number of needles um, that were also picked up safely, of course. So wanted to show those photos because who doesn't want to see good things happening in our neighborhood? Um, you know, the second part is that we, I've brought this up before, I think at the last month's meeting, but we'd really like to, um, and, and I say we, but I can just say me, I'd really like to move forward and 
do some sort of um, grant application for our neighborhood, specifically around beautification. I mentioned the Matson grant caring for Alaska that is now officially running. And I'm gonna share, I apologize for not getting this letter out earlier. Um, so I'm gonna put this on the screen while I talk, but the Matson grant is a micro grant and it, the Caring for Alaska program donates up to $2,500 um, to eligible nonprofits, which we are, that um, organize and conduct community cleanup, riverbank, land rehabilitation, and small inf infrastructure support um, and improvement. And they provide a lot, uh, along with money, they also provide other forms of service, including um, safety vests, trash grabbers, and they'll pay to haul away any trash. So originally, the idea that I've kind of created in my head is doing sort of like a neighborhood caring day um, where we could plan probably for the fall just because it's busy summer, but we could do some sort of event where it was over the weekend where we went out and offered, we got like a 40 yard dumpster, a walk-in dumpster, and we offered free trash service for anybody who had trash in their yards. You know, we, everybody's got a neighbor in their little block where they have seemingly unlimited amounts of trash and it would be one of those situations where we could offer to go pick it up in trucks. We could have volunteers. Um, I didn't have the specific details. So what I was asked to do was just to create a letter of support that I could include in an application. Um, and none of the, the beautification projects would not be funded at the moment by Smart Community Council. It would be, we would be seeking a grant to fund this activity either from Matson or another service, or we would look for in-kind donations. Because I already spark, uh, spoke to Northern Waste um, and they already expressed interest in um, providing in-kind donation of, of the dumpster and some other um, services. So looking at a way to really beautify our neighborhood, there was also a suggestion for landscaping efforts, getting out and, you know, with some, a good old fashioned hammer and nails and fixing people's mail, mailboxes and you know, cleaning up, doing weed whacking along certain sidewalks. So it's kind of a general um, ask, I guess. So the letter, this is the letter that I, I crafted. And it, it just basically says that the Smart Community Council would support um, any efforts to do beautiful, well, not any, but efforts to do beautification um, and clean up of our neighborhood and that the they would support applying for the Matson Caring for Alaska micro grant and then finally, the last sentence, which I wanted to make sure was there that to, to remind folks that this is not me asking for money right now. This is just asking for support of these efforts and that if at a later point, members of the community or decide that this might be something where we need funding from the community council, that that would be a separate ask. Great, good. Thank you. So do we need to vote on this um, supportive letter or how, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it would be, um, I guess, I don't know if I, could I make a, a motion to ask for the support of the community council of this letter? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, as a vice chair, I'm not sure either, but I don't think that should be a problem. I'm going to actually then defer maybe back to the historians, Tom or Bob Oth, previous, or I saw Phil Isley was on also. Um, is that something we could just do and, and do as a vote tonight with people on board, 31 participants? Tom, are you? I think so. Is that okay? Support this letter. Mm -hmm. Do we need... Um, I would Someone second that. To Thank second. You. Great. Me too. All right. Then I guess everyone's had a chance, hopefully, to read that. And it sounds like such a great uh, partnership type thing that all we have to do is kind of put in the elbow grease or, or kind of the labor, which sounds like it's quite fun and pleasant. I mean, I feel like even just, you know, cleaning my own house is more fun if someone helps me <laughs> and doing it alone. So, um, yeah, I would say that um, we could either vote on that more if I want to say formally, or we could just say, is there anyone who You're has You're supposed to open it up for discussion first. Oh, okay, great, Phil, thank you, good point. So let's um, open up for any discussion to occur about this issue. Does anyone have 
Uh, I'm happy to donate a um, that same dump trailer to any effort to improve Spinard. It's it's large, it's commercial, it's easy to move, easy to secure. Anytime you guys need it, just call me. Great. Were you there last time? I know it was around Mother's Day or whenever they did that one. Were you there I was now? there for the uh, one last week that we were just talking about. Uh, like without, without, without the dump trailer, but, but happy to bring it in the future. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Any suggestions before we... I don't know if it would make any difference, but every year when you get your tax bill, they give you a free dump certificate. Yes. And it seems like if somebody wanted to, they could donate those for use for cleanup. Nice, good idea. Yeah, I just got mine. And I'm sure many other owners did too. Good reminder, well, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great idea. And, and I just wanted to add that I think one of the issues that I notice is that there are community members who may not be physically able to get the trash from their yards community to um, to the dump as well. So even though they might get that. So that's where this kind of project came out of is that neighborhood caring where we we could help our neighbors, whether they're, you know, have have a, a disability or, you know, a situation that they can't help themselves in this or, you know, take care of that. Okay, good point, thank you. All right, any other commentary? And then do we, does someone call for the question and we'll approve or disapprove? Well, it's already been first and seconded. Okay. And we had a discussion, so you should call for the question and somebody should put a vote up, yes or no. Great, thank you for your support and help on that, Bill, the experienced ones, Bill. All right, hearing no other commentary or discussion, we'll call for the question. And um, all those in favor of supporting this letter to be sent for this grant can, um, I guess, raise their hand or. <laughs> aye. Aye, aye. aye. Everybody, all in unison, let's do this like a choir. Aye. Aye. <laughs> uh, uh, and and uh, Becky Berger votes as well with an aye. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. That was kind of fun and festive. Thank you, um, Tani, for putting the time in that. And I just was very sad that I missed that, that I was actually uh, out of state picking up a dog that I'm taking care of. And then I saw that beautiful golden in your pictures. Is that the mascot dog for Spinard Cleanup? Yes, uh, she's she's the mascot for all of my trash cleanup and beautification efforts. So she was um, also very popular at these events. Great. What's her name? Uh, that is, that's Sammy. Yeah. Sammy. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm taking care of Jasper. Maybe I'll drag him out here too. Oh, well, he just and I just want to say that I um, will, I'm working with the executive committee over the summer on, on this and we'll be sure to put out any emails either on Facebook or through our um, mail server for the event that, you know, as it comes up or if there's a need for volunteers uh, as well. So just wanted to share that. Thank you so much for yep. supporting this effort as well. Thank you everyone. Perfect. Okay. Next, I will skip over that um, traffic coming for now because I know Josie's been waiting. I spoke with her earlier. So if you would like to start, we're a little bit behind on our time, eight minutes late. But um, yeah, you've got 10 minutes and give us your update on the comprehensive plan for rezoning application and conditional uses for that Anchorage snow disposal site. It's a pretty big topic. Josie? Hi, I'm Josie Wilson, and I'm the public outreach lead for the West Anchorage Snow Disposal Project. And we haven't been here in quite a few months and wanted to provide you first a general update and then an, a quick update on what's going to happen, as Irene mentioned, um, with some comprehend plan amendments and some of those details. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who is our project manager on um, this project uh, for part of the contract team. I also want to let you know we've got Julie and Melinda, both from the municipality of Anchorage that have joined and will be um, available to hear your questions as well. So uh, Bill, you ready to share your screen and do the project update? You are muted. Mm -hmm. So Bill, you need to unmute. You're still muted, Bill. Bill. And there you go. I'm talking and nobody's hearing me. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome Normal to your situation place. for me. My wife, my wife does that to me all the time. 
Um, so yeah, I'll share my screen um, and just have a short presentation. I will. Uh, and what side was it on the right side or the left side? Let's see here. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Okay. So just a short presentation here. I will tell you that there's more information available at westanchoragesnow.com. Um, there's, that comes up at the end of the slideshow, but that, but that point, uh, it's too late to write it down, so I'll tell you up, up front. Um, this uh, first slide here is a picture of the existing snow disposal site. It's on Northwood Drive, uh, right across from the um, airport parking garage and uh, on the way to the CLEP uh, street maintenance facility. Now, this picture was shot in, in uh, 2012, really large snow year, and you can see that moving snow um, is a pretty big deal in this town. Uh, this snow disposal site, um, although it's not in Spinard, serves the Spinard area, and so you guys are, are definitely part of it. Um, say this is, uh, this is a year when they had a lot of snow. The, the problems with this snow disposal site, of course, is that it is located on um, airport property and the municipality and the airport have been unable to reach a long-term agreement on it. It needs some upgrades and the city is not, uh, has not been able to get the long-term lease that would be required for the capital improvements of the site. So we're looking for a new site. And if I can get the screen to change, there we go. Um, so here's a, a map of the area. You see the existing snow disposal site off of uh, International Airport and uh, also the, the proposed selected site, which is in Connors Bog, uh, south and east of where the existing site is. Trying to get my uh, screen to roll here. So HDR was hired by the municipality to, to select the site for and design, um, do the public process for the permitting for and uh, the design of this new site. And the first part of the process, of course, was the selection of site. And you can see um, on this slide, the process that we went through to, um, obviously the site has to be within the snow disposal area. Uh, otherwise it is, uh, and we incur pretty large trucking costs to take the snow out of the site to, or out of the, the service area to another site. So we, narrowed it down pretty quickly um, to 19 sites that were possible within the area of where snow was, is uh, picked up from. And then we narrowed those down based on um, other uh, criteria. We narrowed first down to five sites uh, based on the zoning, the, uh, the locations, the size, the availability, and uh, access off of a main thoroughfare were some of the, the pieces there. If you want to go see the full site selection study, you can find it there at westanchoragesnow.com. So from those five sites, it, it turned out almost all of them, in fact, I think all of them are in wetland sites. It's pretty much the only land uh, available in large tracts that uh, has not already been developed. And so we took all those um, largely wetland sites and then applied additional criteria to them, um, looking at parks and open space, uh, the configuration, access, things like that. And we narrowed it down to two sites. The two sites that was, was narrowed down to, one of them is in the north end of Strawberry Bog off of um, Raspberry in Minnesota. And the other one was in the north east corner of Connors Bog. So finally, we narrowed that down to a single site, which is the one in Connors Bog. And um, the primary reason that we chose that site was its low impact on residents. It's, it's probably the one parcel in the whole municipality that's as far from any residential neighbors as you can get. And as you can imagine, a snow disposal site, it runs all night. It's, uh, there's always um, cats running to push the snow around, you got loaders, you got trucks coming and going, and it can be fairly noisy and um, disruptive to 
people sleeping. So we look pretty hard for a site that could be run 24 seven and uh, it's settled out on this site here. The, the parcel that's shown here in green is uh, 32 acres, I believe. I don't think the site, the snow's below site, the actual pad is gonna be on the 14, 15 acre size, um, similar to the one that's existing. The other good things about this site, it, uh, the existing site drains, um, meltwater drains into Connors Bog and into Connors Lake. It, it's maintained the level of Connors Lake over the years and the new site will do the same. It drains into the same drain, which is, um, they're under adequate receiving waters. Of course, the bad thing about this site and, and truly all the sites that we did look at was that it's in um, a pretty pristine piece of class A wetlands. And, uh, there's no getting around that at this point. So, so a quick rundown on the on the steps that we're going through for the permitting process. Um, the parcel is currently zoned TR transitional, and we need to um, rezone that to public lands and institutions. Uh, transitional zoning was a, a zoning designation that a bunch of parcels got sort of lumped into that nobody had really figured out what they were going to do with them yet. And this particular parcel had that uh, transitional zoning and uh, we need to go through the rezoning process in order to use it for a snow disposal site. Then after we get it rezoned, we need to look at the comprehensive plan, the West Anchorage plan, and um, reconfigure the 2040 land use planning map so that it, uh, right now those parcels in the bog are um, designated as parks and open space and obviously a snow disposal site, although it's still open space, it's not really much of a park. So we have to update the comprehensive plan. Um, then there's a third small uh, approval that we need. The access road to the site passes through a piece of Connors Bog Park to the south of the club station um, area. And we need approval to use that small corridor. It's like two tenths of an acre to put the access road along the north side of the park parcel. Then after that, there will be um, a few variances that we have to have to gain from the UDC, Urban Design Commission, in order to put this um, snow disposal site in a bog, most of the snow disposal sites that have currently been designed and constructed and are in use in the city are all on upland sites. This particular one's gonna end up being in the bog and taking advantage of the water processing features of, of the bog environment. So the design is gonna be slightly different and there will be a few variances that will be required to make that work. Hi, Bill. Um, we've allocated about 10 minutes for this presentation and we're right at the 10 minute mark. Um, you're welcome to wrap up. Um, in the next minute or so if you can. Okay, I'm getting pretty close here. Um, so then after variances, we uh, seek conditional use permits for both land reclamation and the snow disposal site. Here is the timeline showing where we are. Um, right now we're doing field work and, and uh, permitting for the project. Public involvement is still ongoing. And here is a place to find more information. I already said you guys can go to westanchorage.snow.com. And here is a page of questions. So I'll take any, any uh, questions that aren't too difficult, and I'll deflect the more difficult ones to Melinda and Julie. Hey, thank you, Bill. I see Peggy or Bob have your hand up on the screen. Go ahead, Peggy. Uh, hi. Well, it's Bob this time. Thank you, Bob. I, I guess it's more of a more of a comment. I mean, um, Peggy and I both worked on the West Anchorage District Plan that was adopted in 2012, and that plan said that the municipality should try to obtain uh, ownership in some way of the existing snow dump owned, owned by the airport, and and. And there were a lot of options for doing so with a with a, a land <clears throat> a land exchange or or some other process. And um, I was part of a couple of committees that were um, 
trying to work out an exchange. And, and so to me personally, it's very frustrating that um, we're now at the spot, you know, almost 10 years later where, oh, we're just, we're just giving up and we're gonna build a new one very close to a pre-existing one. Um, and the West Anchorage district plan also says that this specific parcel, which as you mentioned is class A wetlands, 30 acres uh, is high value wetlands that should be preserved forever as wetlands. And that's also in the plan. So it's very frustrating to say, oh, well that, that's the new snow dump because it's far away from, from residents, but we're losing, it's one of the biggest Parse individual parcels of class A wetlands in the municipality, and we're just using it as a snow dump. It just, it just seems very like a waste and, and frustrating to me. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely that's a sentiment that's been expressed, probably both by the project team and and by other um, people in other community councils as well that we've gone to talk to. Maybe I would um, deflect this to Melinda and let her talk to us a little bit. She's thought long and hard about it and might have um, a little bit better background information for you as far as why that process did not come to fruition. Hello, everybody. I'm Melinda Tsu, project manager with the municipality. Um, you know, Robin Ward is our real estate director and pm &E, project management and engineering, our team has been communicating with her all along and finding out what the history is. But it's it's been a long road of negotiations between the municipality and seeking either acquisition, a land trade, or even a long-term lease. And it just hasn't come to fruition. It's, it's not been successful. You know, currently we're only looking at a year to year lease and it's time for us to make sure we have something secure in the future so that we can, you know, uh, provide capital improvements and assure there's no interruptions for service. You know, the bottom line is it, it is such an essential service to provide snow removal and providing safe streets and having a, a sound site for, you know, for years to come and find a site that we can rely on in perpetuity. But uh, we agree, we we had wished uh, something else would um, come about, but we've checked in with the airport just as recently as February this year and the same answer. So the airport has been adamant that um, that land would only be available for a long-term lease uh, if FAA would uh, approve it for airport use only, so for aviation use. So that's that's where the municipality is at now, trying to make sure we can find something secure for you know our future for West Anchorage. Okay. And Irene, I think it's important to note, I'm taking notes as the public involvement person, and I'm so I'm taking notes of the comments that we did receive. I know we're limited on time, but I just wanted to let all of you know I am taking notes on that. Great, thank you, Josie. And certainly I mean, I also, should be continuing to make comments if we can't finish out tonight verbally to maybe send comments to this um, site. Where does the airport dump its snow? I asked that question too. They have their own snow disposal site um, over, I think it's just east of the airport post office there. Go on Google, you can see the site. Um, it was also constructed partially in a wetland, I believe. Um, but it's been there for a number of years and that's where they take most of their snow. Bob, do you have another comment or? Well, it's I'm Iggy actually. Okay. Um, and was that Phil that just asked that last question? Yes, Phil Isley, he's a Thank former you. SCC. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question? Hey, Peggy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as Bob said, we both worked on the West Anchorage District plan and 
I, I have a lot of problems because not only is this in violation of the West Anchorage District plan that's not even 10 years old, but there's five other plans that have been adopted in our ordinances in the United, in, sorry, in Anchorage. And it's going against all six plans. And it's, I'm thinking if we have six plans that are outlining valuable land, and this was supposed to be transition and the Muni can't dedicate this over a 10 year period, I find that really alarming. I, and I also think that it's, well, number one, I don't know why you're doubling the size of it because you are going to ruin that land as, as something as park, as opposed to just open space. But the other thing is that the people that are using Connors Bog, and a lot of them do use that AWW um, access road, that you're going to be looking at that. And that's going to take a, lo a lot away from the aesthetics of being in a park when you've got a 32 acre uh, you know, snow dump. And in the summertime, it's just going to be a big a dirt, you know, dirt pile. And I, I'm really upset by this because I think the Muni's dropped the ball. I know that you've been in negotiations, but I, I still think that the Muni just has not handled this well. And I, and I think if, if something can go against six adopted ordinance mm -hmm. plans, I don't know what counts as a plan. Sorry. All right, thank you for your suggestion. Melinda, is it Melinda? Yeah. Do you want, is there time for just a little bit of a response? Okay, let's so, try it. We're yeah, I'll it. make it quick. We are thoroughly looking at all those planning documents and confirming, you know, the consistency of what the plan said. And some of it is that the there's just a lack of developable lands. There's a lack of industrial lands and there's a lack of a large space for a facility. You know, and the plans do recognize that there is a priority given for finding um, available land for purposes of public use and to site public facilities. So even though open space granted is important as well, um, also, you know, something for maintaining the safety of our roadways and our residents um, is also very important. So it's an essential facility, you know, and land is limited. And that's really what came down to looking at those plans. If you look at them, they didn't uh, cite where those future um, snow disposal sites would be located. So that's something that was essentially missing from some of the plans. They, they said there's a need. They said in West Anchorage specifically, yes, they wanted to see if it was, uh, we would be able to negotiate uh, long-term use of that current site. And they also, the plan also identified the need to find a new site. So for two sites to be located, you know, where would they go? But anyways, the, the positive thing is our project team is working with our planning department and we're thoroughly looking at all the steps needed to um, move forward. And uh, if you want to follow along on our web, web page, you can kind of outline those steps and, and contact us also if you have any further questions. But um, I'll limit it to that uh, with respect to time. Okay, thank you, Belinda. Uh, my you bet. goes to um, John Johansson with the airport. Um, so I don't know, I don't wanna get into that this evening, but obviously there must be some powers that be with airport being you know, federal thing and state lands and et cetera. So obviously very complicated when it gets to the legalities of um, who has access and what is the most important and certainly safety and access is huge for many aspects of our community. All right, thank you. I guess we will close on that note. Um, do continue to give input to these um, email addresses or the websites if you would like to continue with that. All right, we need to move quickly now. Um, the next item is the Title II Amendment for Parking. And Elizabeth Appleby with the Muni Planning Department, are you still on? Yep, yes, hi, I'm still here. Okay. And uh, it's a, a Title 21, that's our zoning code. And I just have a, a short presentation. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Okay, we'll probably have to um, ask if it's all right to go over maybe 10 minutes tonight for the meeting. So thank you. Go and ahead. then 
if you could just let me know what you see, because I I most often share over Teams. So do you see a, a slideshow page currently? With lots and lots of um, icons showing different programs, yeah. OK, let me change this. Yep. OK, how about now? Now, problems with the status quo. Yes, I see that. OK, yes. So um, uh, this slide shows some problems with our current parking regulations. So uh, in certain areas of town, uh, the planning department feels that uh, there's an excess of parking and we think we could uh, make more efficient uh, use of land there. And these are some problems that our current parking re regulations create by uh, encouraging access only by, by vehicle. So it's uh, inhospitable design and walking environments. Uh, for small infill developers, uh, sometimes it uh, creates a burden to provide parking uh, that limits uh, what they can develop, thwarts business opportunities in older commercial districts where it's hard to provide parking, uh, and overall thwarts development and economic activity. Uh, so we have these plans. Uh, we have a plan for um, transit and transportation, and we have the Anchorage 2040 land use plan. Um, this, uh, this amendment to Title 21, which again is our zoning code, carries out objectives uh, 4, 3, and 4, 6 of the Anchorage 2040 land use plan. Uh, the, I guess, overall uh, reason we would like to amend the parking regulations is to reduce costs of development and housing, support infill redevelopment in urban neighborhoods, and make alternative travel modes more practical. Um, related to the, the snow dump, uh, I, I guess there was a discussion on uh, limited land in Anchorage. Uh, this, this uh, parking project sort of relates to that in that uh, we think it could lead to a more efficient uh, use of, of land in, in Anchorage. Uh, so the scope is we're looking at some area specific lower parking requirements in urban neighborhoods and key transit corridors. We'd like to streamline approval of administrative parking reductions and give a few more op options uh, for developers to get a parking reduction. Uh, we'd like to uh, support alternative modes of site access, such as rideshare, walking, bicycling, and transit, and to allow and encourage narrower driveways for small multi-unit housing developments, uh, most likely uh, within urban areas. So what this does, does and does not do is it takes a step towards right-sizing parking and driveway requirements in targeted areas of town and focuses on a low-cost fix that can be done immediately. What it does not do is it uh, does not change uh, or reduce minimum parking requirements in suburban parts of the Anchorage Bowl or in uh, Chugiak, Eagle River, or Girdwood. And it's also not a comprehensive reassessment of the use specific parking requirements. So it's a bit of uh, an incremental step in um, certain areas of town. Uh, and those areas tend to have a gridded street network uh, and access to public transit. Uh, we've we've started categorizing uh, terms, I guess, of the, the areas we're talking about. So Spinard is in our edge urban uh, focus area. So uh, I just have a couple, maybe three slides that just go over what is in here. Just just as, this is just meant to be a quick overview. Uh, so in our traditional urban neighborhoods, uh, so just South Edition, Fairview, Mountain View, um, areas close to downtown, we'd like to lower minimum parking requirements um, most likely by about 20 to 35%. Um, these areas have that good gridded street network and pedestrian facilities and it's in character with their development. Uh, this slide is where we'd like to recognize the edge urban neighborhoods and the transit supportive corridors. Uh, those are the transit supportive corridors were identified in the 2040 land use plan. Here we're looking at uh, lowering minimum parking requirements by 10 to 20 percent. Um, so you can see Spinard is an edge urban neighborhood. This map isn't great. Uh, it's somewhat intentionally that way just because we're still um, collecting feedback on the uh, exact areas we're, we're looking to propose. We, we don't have a community discussion draft yet for this code amendment. Uh, we'd also like to streamline approvals for developers to get a parking reduction strategy. So right now, if you want to reduce your 
your parking requirement, you have to get approval by the traffic engineer and the planning director uh, and often conduct a parking study. So we'd like to make some of these parking reductions uh, where you just can get them administratively uh, as long as you meet certain criteria and it's a reduction up to a certain percent. And then we'd like to also add a, a few new ones. And uh, some of these uh, new ones in particular, we think could it, uh, be good options for mixed use developments. Uh, I think this is the last slide on what's actually in the ordinance, or uh, I guess I, I guess proposed code change. There is not currently an, an ordinance out there. We're a, a bit a ways away from that stuff. Uh, anyway, citywide, we would like to delete the requirement for um, that most non-residential uses have to provide at least three parking spaces no, no matter what. Uh, and we'd also like to have uh, ride hail spots and electric vehicle charging stations count towards the required parking or, or maybe towards a portion of a required parking spot. And then in uh, urban areas and along the transit corridors, um, we'd like to encourage more pedestrian oriented site plans. And uh, one element we're looking at is to uh, increase bike parking requirements, in particular for uh, multifamily housing developments and uh, large employers, uh, and, and to include covered and secure bike parking areas. So this is where we are. Uh, we've just been having lots of consultations uh, with different agencies at the Muni, with community councils, with uh, sorted groups in town um, we're presenting to the chamber later this month. Uh, we're hoping to have a community discussion draft out uh, some, at some point this month. Um, we are having a noon hour design workshop. You're welcome to attend that and to provide feedback. Uh, we do have a web page for this project. Um, there is a questionnaire on that web page. I'll just click this link and I'll, um, I'll share this in the chat. Uh, but if I just click here, I guess I already had it open, so I'll close this duplicate tab. Uh, but this is our project webpage. So if you want to see, review this slide presentation, or I, I cut it down a bit for the community councils, um, that's here. You can get more information on the background. Uh, to the right here is uh, where we have our questionnaire. Uh, and then this is information on that uh, noon hour design workshop. And that is the end of what I wanted to make sure I share with you tonight. Uh, and I'm available for questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I see Paul, your hand is up and then Peggy. Yes, Paul. Question, uh, is Title 21 hurting or helping our community? Uh, I, I guess that's sort of a, a broad question. No, so it's, title not, it's not a broad question. Your, 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 your presentation is about how it's hurting. Oh, overall, and from your perspective, where does Title 21 fit in, and should we, you know, keep going with Title 21 in Anchorage? Well, yes. So Title 21 is is the zoning code. There's there's really not any community that that doesn't have a zoning code. That's not true. That, that Title 21 is unique to Anchorage and other communities, but we could change it. We we, we could revert back to earlier codes. The, that's correct that you can amend the zoning code. That's what this is. But I, I guess your question to not have a zoning code, I, I don't think that's, no, I, I uh, that's realistic. Have, I, no, I didn't say not have a zoning code. I said revert back away from Title 21. Because Title 21, even Cook Inlet Housing has been concerned they can't build low-income housing because they have parking problems because of Title 21. So in your opinion, is Title 21 helping or hurting Anchorage? I, I guess I think it's good for Anchorage. I think I believe in this amendment. Uh, and why is it good? For I Anchorage? guess when you. Why is it good? For I, I guess when you say. So I, I guess when you say Title Twenty One, though, that's like our entire zoning code. Like a, no, no, it, no, no, it, no. It's it's a new code. And we can yes. It to so, code. so I don't know what number it was called before, but it's title. When I say when someone says Title Twenty One, that's the entire zoning code. No, so it may have been. That's, that's the new code. We can go back to the old code. So, you know, old code? yes, I know that there have been amendments over time. I, I just, I think this, maybe I could talk okay. to you after this because I think it's a little off topic because it's, uh, so it's Title 21 has been amended over time. Like that's, it's how uh, municipal codes work. Like they're constantly changed. 
So, I mean, sure, someone could put an amendment back for the code to change it to how it was in the past. Uh, but when you say Title 21, just just know that that means it's like the entire zoning code for this the city. Like it may have a different number before, but uh, well, well, the, the, the yeah, yeah. Meant something. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so if you want to talk more oh. about what Title 21 is, I, I I'd be happy to talk with you later. But just uh, uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to I, clarify I, I, that. I, I understand. Okay. Paul, yeah. I, I, would, I would support this change. Okay. Asking a question of a personal. A decision like that might be a lot off, off the top. How yeah, and I, I get you though. Like we hear from developers, like that's why we're putting this this yeah. change forward because we we have heard that uh, that parking is one thing that limits it. So it's one thing we're trying to change. If if that helps, I guess answer too. Well, you, you're about, you're, hurt, you're hurting the most vulnerable. What um, on June 9th, um, the, is that meeting you said open to everyone? Could Paul attend that meeting? Or yes. Else? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we're having a design workshop. So it's on the, I just sent the the web link to Meg. So uh, hopefully I did that correctly so she can share it with everyone. And, um, and yeah, anyone is welcome to attend. And we also have that questionnaire too. So you can, um, you can fill it out. And uh, um, we do hope that these changes will uh, make it easier for someone to build more affordable housing in Anchorage. All right, that is a lot of information also. Thank you very much, I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Um, so anyone else commentary? I'm seeing right now that we are uh, six minutes past our time. So I'm gonna have to ask if we can continue. Is everybody okay with that? Of course, if you're not, you can certainly drop off. We just wanna make sure that if you wanna to try to win the prize, you have to be present to win. Um, so let's uh, look at, the neighborhood and community announcements. Maybe I need to go back first to this um, traffic calming resolution amendment. It says amendment of proposal to add additional project for traffic calming consideration. Um, it has my name on that. And I will honestly say that I probably don't have the background to know exactly what needs to be done in that, but it sounds like that might be something to vote on also, Tani. Can you help me? You're fabulous, please. Yeah, or I don't know if Meg, Meg wants to help, but basically it was that at our last, um, so we had already put a resolution for traffic calming um, to the community council and it passed by, um, I think there was no objection. So right. it was passed, it listed specific streets that we thought, we had heard back from council members and the um, members of the community, Spinarchy community. Um, then we got, I believe it was a couple emails um, from community members who gave us information after the fact. And so the option during our last executive committee meeting was to do this quick amendment where we just added them to that original resolution, or we would have to essentially wait until next year um, when yeah. this process came around again. And the consensus was that we didn't want to um, impede any sort of improvement or traffic calming in our neighborhood by making someone wait um, till next year to go through the process with us because um, it's already a long enough process through the municipality and they require community going to your community council first. So that's right. the background. Um, I remember that now. So how can the amendment, can it just be adding those suggestions? I, yeah, so the, I, I, the, the, the document has it has the amendment. That's the resolution amendment. So Meg has a link. Yep, she just put it in the chat. Um, so to vote on the um, amendment, it's right above the one from Elizabeth. So Meg, you might want to post that again, just so people have the fresh one. Um, so you just vote to approve the amendment um, or not. And um, if there are any questions, I can you know try and answer them. But it's pretty straightforward. Okay, great. Now I, I do remember we discussed that, but gosh, it was two weeks ago. Okay, so we'll let that happen. If the link is available there, that would be great. Everybody can add their vote. Um, and then let's try to go to the number nine item, uh, neighborhood or community announcements. Um, anyone that would like to share something quickly. Also, we used to, when we meet in person, um, have people just introduce themselves if it's their first time. Um, to a meeting and um, yeah, so that's open for now. If anyone wants to add something for the good of the community or share their brand new to town. 
I see I, uh, Sarah. Sorry, Preska? I actually have a question for the traffic calling. Okay, um, great. But, um, we'll get Minnesota and Lois. So does traffic calming include just better traffic flow? Because that's actually a street that I end up getting stuck on more than I'm running into traffic speeding. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're saying in a vehicle, does it help with it? So it's a mix. It's a lot of different things. Um, it just is meant to um, be do safer things for the for the neighborhood for for speeding for pedestrians for bicycles, um, but my understanding is that it also is meant to um, help with the flow of traffic in certain areas. So if there's constant issues, they look at a ver variety of solutions. So it's not just speed bumps. It's just uh, I mean it's an enormous department that works on on that across the board. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks. Then I saw um, someone else had their hand up. Oh, Paul again. Yes, Paul. Can you unmute? I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, back to the hotels. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to really do strong resolutions in the future about the behavior of hotel owners. And uh, Tom brought up a really good point. We have a single owner uh, behaving very irresponsibly across the city. I think as a council, we should formulate a plan to write up or draft a strong resolution about this guy. And when uh, anything comes up, Tom, you have any inputs on that? Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, I also think that the council should think about, you know, we have a new mayor that maybe we'll look at this differently than, than previous mayors. And, um, you know, of course, we're not meeting again until September. So maybe talk about it amongst ourselves over the summer and come up with a plan because we have certain hotels that are, people are dying. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Literally. been multiple deaths at some of these hotels. And um, I think that the community should demand better. My, 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 my second point, uh, the cleanup, I really, uh, Tony, we had a great time that night. We went from eight people on the Napa uh, pickup to 35 people uh, the night we had the thing up. I want to thank Save Anchorage. I promoted it heavily on Save Anchorage, and those folks showed up. They love Spinard, and they uh, want to get involved in the council. So just to, just a cheerio to those guys um, on Save Anchorage. And then, um, side note, before we get the $28,000 that we have in our reserves, perhaps part of that could be used for the kind of projects Tony's talking about for cleaning up and beautifying Anchorage. We can talk about that in the fall. That's all I got. We will, I will share this, of course, with um, all of us in the executive committee. We will meet again through the summer. Great. Anyone else? Comments? Anybody new in town that would like to share where they move from? Okay. All right, well, busy night. Um, and I guess we'll be hopefully- I have a comment. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Um, let me see, on the second Monday of June, I believe it's the 14th, I am doing a guided hypnotic meditation at the Adam Center at 6000 C Street. It starts at seven o'clock. There's a donation of 10 bucks and it's Usually a pretty interesting session. It lasts about an hour and a half. Okay, and that was at 7 p.m. on the 14th? Yep. Okay. And, and it's a Monday night. Monday, gotcha. Okay. Sounds like something very positive. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else have something to share? Okay. All right, let's try to call it a night. And how are we doing with our door prize gas gift card? I know that's arena's arena, but Meg, did you get figured out for that? <laughs> yeah, I'm in a little frazzled over here trying okay. to do my different stuff and stuff. Uh, I'm sorry. One more thing. Tani has her hand up too. Hold yeah, on. sorry, Meg. Um, because it's related to our gift cards, um, Out of the Box is officially leaving their Spinard location um mid june i mid july i believe so if you want a gift card last time um you should definitely use it and also they're looking to reopen um 
I totally spaced about this and I wanted to share. So any last minute support um, for their business? They're, they're a really great couple. They've been a great addition to the Spinard neighborhood and we'll certainly miss them. But, you know, reminder to use the gift cards that you might have won with us. Great. Do you know, are they moving to another part of town or closing shop? They are taking a break. COVID was pretty tough on them, but they're looking for another place. Okay. That's the hope. Thank you, Tony, for that update. Meg, let's well, go. I was just going to say, I know one person messaged me saying they didn't get their gift card from last time. So if someone else is also in that boat, please. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Paul. It wasn't me. It was Arena. And she's not here. So I'll get with her on that. But if there was someone else here, I can, I'll check the notes if I remember to see who else that was. But if you're you and you're here and you didn't get a gift card, let me know because I can follow up. Um, just wanted to give a quick update on the uh, traffic calming resolution. It passed uh, nine to one. Um, right. And I, I think there was only, um, by the time I pulled this, uh, 12 folks that were still present. So your chances are high. I'm doing a random number generator. Um, and Owen, oh, we're doing a gas card giveaway because I think, uh, Gosh, Tani might have to uh, correct me on this, but some of the uh, gas gift cards, I think, were from places that have closed. And yes. so certainly, yeah, maybe one in town. So we're wanting to make sure we spend that so they don't expire. Um, hey, um, can I interject? I'm sorry. I, I'm on my phone, so I don't know how to work it. But I know that all the shells are going to become bitus. And I'm wondering if there's someone we can call. I guess I can look into that to see if they would transfer to the Vitus without having to scout around town looking for the shell stations. Oh. But I'll certainly look into that and see where that stands. That would be but great. Would be um, all right, shoot, I lost my place. Hold on, going back to the random number generator. Number uh, that one is uh, two. The second person on the list that signed in was Sarah Prescott. Congratulations, Sarah. Yay, Sarah. Hey. I don't think you've won recently, so I think you have never won, ever. Yeah, I'm one of right. the unlucky people too. So congratulations, <laughs> nice. Sarah. And um, yeah. Great, winner. Sarah, thank you so much. Great, all right. Well, we'll look for each other around Spinard and go to different star uh, stores and businesses and um, parks and ride our bikes and enjoy an Alaskan summer. And we'll see everyone. Uh, September 1st, first Wednesday of the month again. All right. Good night, everyone. That was fabulous. And good night. Thanks, Irene. Good night.